I'm worried that I'll, I'll never read a book again. <laughs> I've achieved nothing today. It's quarter past one. Am I enjoying it though? Good question. I feel amazing. What if the plot does go downhill and I don't end up liking this one? And I was like, I don't know what I'm posting this week. And I was like, oh, what if I did this and just called it this? And, and now it's a thing and I find that's the one I find the weirdest. I've done, a, I've done a naughty. This is a quote of Mr. Fury 2.0. Everything in my gut is telling me that this is not real. Just before we get into this vlog, I would like to introduce you guys or reintroduce you guys perhaps to the sponsor of today's video, which is once again, the wonderful Wild. If you guys are unfamiliar with Wild, they make sustainable body products. They are best known for their deodorant, but they have also recently branched out into shower gel with refillable shower gel bottles. But today I have the limited edition festive scents to show you. And I don't know what it is this year, but I'm feeling so festive. And I'm really excited about Wild festive festive range. So we do have the limited edition festive case which has a magical starry night design. You do also have the option of having your case customized. These are refillable so there is no plastic waste in any of Wild's products or packaging and their refills are actually compostable. The three festive scents, the first one we have is fresh mountain air as you can imagine this is a very clean very fresh scent almost like fabric powdery we also have prosecco and winter berries this one is like citrusy with like an underlying fruity scent to it and my favorite is of course the most warm scent which is spiced orange and pear this one is fruity it's spicy it's warm like we knew this was going to be my favorite of the three we know what kind of scents that i like so i've been using wild deodorant for a number of years now i think it's over two years probably about two and a half wild deodorants are also not only really good for the environment but also good for your body they don't have any harsh chemicals any parabens or any aluminium so if you guys would like to check out wild for yourself and get your hands on any of their limited edition products or anything in the entire wild range i am happy to let you guys know that i currently have the best discount that wild has ever offered i have a code that will get you 30 percent off anything in the wild range if you would like to take me up on this offer, you can use the code BOOKS30 to get 30% off any Wild products. And once again, a big thank you to Wild for sponsoring this video. Welcome to the second installment in my month of prioritizing my subscription box books. If you guys don't know what's happening here for the month of November, I am almost exclusively reading books that I have received in various subscription boxes over the years. And to give us a little bit of direction at the beginning of every vlog, I am pulling a prompt out of this jar that is going to decide the focus of the the upcoming vlog. So at this point, I have no idea what I'm going to be reading for the next however many days, and we're going to find out together. So let us pick our prompt for the next week or so. I'm going to go for, no, second guess it up. This one. It's a year. It's 2021, so I have to, I can only read books that I received in subscription boxes for the year 2021. <laughs> this is gonna take some hunting down actually, because I don't obviously know the years, the publishing years off the top of my head, but we'll dig around and we'll see what we can find. So because we're doing 2021, I'm looking in some of the older places, some of the places I've had books for quite some time. I think I only, did I only start getting fairy loot at the, no, it was the end of 2020, right? So there are still potentially fairy loot books we can use for this. I can't remember if I was still getting Owl Crate. Let's look at this one. This one is an Owl Crate edition, I'm pretty sure. And we are looking at 2020 for that one. So that one's too old. She Who Became the Sun, maybe? 2021, this is an excellent pick because I wanted to read this for quite some time. This one is the July 2021 pick from Illumicrate. I am currently also participating in the Clear Your Shit Readathon throughout November and December. And one of the prompts is to have somebody choose between two books. So I think because I pulled She Who Became the Sun, I'm gonna go and find the Tasha Sori book that was also released. I'm pretty sure it was an Illumicrate book for 2021 because they had like the sapphic trifecta. I've already read one of those books earlier this year, which was the CL Clark one. What was that book called? This one. I've already read this one. And so I have 
two of the sapphic trifecta left to read and I have two Libras. I know two Libras. So I was going to get a Libra to pick the book for this prompt because the prompt is representing Libra in the readathon. But based on the books that we're choosing from, I think I'm going to ask Ro from Wandering Through Worlds to do the honours for me. So I'm going to go get the Tasha Suri one. I'll send a message to Ro and we'll see what she decides. I feel like we should just take a moment to appreciate Hamilton, who is very, very asleep. Hey, baby boy. Are you having a cozy Friday? Yes, you are. So the book is The Jasmine Throne by Tasha Sori. And this one is May 2021. So these two are our options. I'm going to send a picture of these to Ro. And when she gets back to me, I'll get back to you and we'll find out what our first book of this vlog is going to be. So I've just finished editing last week's vlog and I'm about to make a start on my next candle restock, which is a little bit late in the day to be doing. So it's like 2 p.m. That's something that I normally start first thing in the morning. But today has been one of those days where I have lots of like 30 minute tasks to do so it feels like I've spent all day accomplishing nothing but I've actually done everything on my list apart from start the candles and proof the vlog when it's like exported but Ro has got back to me and made her decision and the first book that I'm going to be reading for this vlog is She Who Became the Sun by Shelley Parker Chan which I'm so happy that Ro went with this one because if I'm being honest I do need to read the Tasha Sori book eventually I do want to give it a try but I have DNF'd a book by Tasha Sori before, so The Jasmine Throne is not really a priority for me. And this one, on the other hand, I am very excited about because not only is it a military fantasy, which I love, it's also a historical fantasy, which is a recent discovery that I also love. So if I remember correctly, this one is about either a brother and sister or twins. They're from a very poor family. It's set in like the 1300s. Yeah, the 1300s in China. The peasant families like are doing horrifically as you could imagine if you're a peasant in the 1300s. This brother and sister are visited by a seer in the village where they live. They are told their fortunes, told their fates, and the boy is destined for greatness while the girl is destined to die early. But when the village is attacked, the boy actually dies and his sister then takes his place and enters a monastery and essentially steps into the fate that was supposed to be her brother's. So I'm real excited to read this one. I did also check on the Illumicrit website as well because the thing, the pressure that I feel with subscription box books and reading them is I don't want to be buying all of these special editions, like special edition sequels to books that I don't want, like that I don't enjoy. But I find it hard obviously to keep up with all of the subscription boxes that I get. So I checked on the Illumicrit website and the sequel to this is still available. So fingers crossed I will really enjoy it and then I can pick up the sequel to this. I do really like the design on this as well. You don't get too too many like too many warm tone subscription box books really but especially not like such a vibrant orange and I think that the sequel is blue and also really nice so I'm excited to start this one will probably be a little bit later on although I do plan like after I finish working I'm going to be working out after dinner and watching Scream 4 tonight so I don't anticipate getting a ton read today but this weekend is my last weekend of November where I don't have any plans so I'm pretty much planning on doing nothing because the coming weekends are going to have enough going on in them that this weekend will be a big fat pile of nothing and, and I'm happy about that that's what I want <laughs> having the chillest Saturday afternoon. Aaron sent me a message 
recommending the She Who Became the Sun audiobook and it actually it's like 14 hours and something long which just comes under the 15 hour audiobook limit that Spotify Premium now has. So I am, um, I've listened to three chapters, I'm up to chapter four of that which I think is, I haven't moved my bookmark yet but it is 62. Progress on this is pretty decent and while I'm listening to this I'm working on my cross stitch which I wanted to show you guys my progress so far. This is a pretty small section. The pattern is in four parts so this is a quarter of the pattern and I've done like this much so like a quarter this is like the smallest half of this page the top as well obviously it's more dense down here but I'm like two-thirds of the way down and not quite halfway across so it's gonna be bigger actually than I anticipated it being but I'm having a relaxing time and a real chill Saturday but Curtis is playing free for at the minute but we have been installing Boulder's Gate and I'm actually really concerned that when that finishes installing which it has like 15 minutes left on it I'm worried that I'll, I'll never read a book again I love Sunday. I love Sunday so much. It's like, what time even is it? I've achieved nothing today. It's quarter past one. I took Brie for a walk first thing and by first thing I mean 9.30 because it's Sunday. I had a shower and since then I've just been alternating between reading. I'm doing sprints on my own again, very much like last Sunday. And I'm alternating between reading and watching YouTube with my cross stitch. So like with last Sunday as well, I do have two books. I am reading The Heroes by Joe Abercrombie alongside the books for this vlog because the live show for this is next Sunday and I'm actually technically a day behind so I do need to get through another 47 pages of this today but I'm reading a, a section of this to every 100 pages I read of She Who Became the Sun. I don't think I love the audiobook for this. I have listened to 130 pages of it and it is quite easy to follow. It's getting a little bit more difficult now because I'm in the second part of the book where we have some new characters introduced and it's also turned multi-POV at that point. So I think what I'm gonna do is I need to get to my Amy's to get to page 200 before I switch back to the heroes. I'm gonna try just reading this section physically and see if I have any different reaction to it because the audiobook is good in terms of being easy to follow along. But I would say it's like, it's it's an okay audiobook. I could listen to it, but the narrator is very American, which I feel like is absorbing some of the atmosphere of this book that I feel I would be able to get better like would come across better if I read this physically. The only negative like to that though is that the audiobook I'm assuming has the correct pronunciation for all of the Chinese like names and places in here. Can you sit down please? Don't knock the- don't knock the tripod. Oh my god. I- I don't know if it's like a, a mood thing, but just yesterday and today I have not been in the mood for her shit. But um, yeah, the pronunciation in the audiobook is obviously going to be better than the pronunciation that I come up with in my head. So I will lose that by reading it physically, but I just feel like with this now turning multi POV, I don't really feel like the narrator is putting any effort into actually differentiating between the perspectives. And it does just read like a very standard audiobook. Like it feels like a very standard audio narration. I do think though that the writing in here isn't the most flowery, decorative or descriptive. So part of that could be down to the writing not necessarily being overly atmospheric, but we'll give it a try and we'll see. I'm sad because I have been enjoying listening to the audio and being able to do other things alongside. And I was planning on getting out that jigsaw that I started last year, the Brie ate a piece of, and I kind of put it away, didn't want to look at it. I was going to get that out and try and finish it today, but I don't know if I'm going to be continuing with the audio. So while I have a little bit of time today, Day, with it being Sunday we'll figure out if reading this physically is the better way to go but this one is pretty much as I described it at the beginning it's about a girl who is a peasant she lives in a small village and her father and she actually came from a much larger family but as the years have gone on as there has been drought and like natural disaster in the mm. land as the famine has increased her family members have dwindled and at the beginning of this book it does kind of get through this opening synopsis quite quickly but 
raiders come to the village where the girl lives and her brother and her father are killed and so she steps into the destiny that has been laid out for her brother where he's going to achieve this like great task and she goes to a monastery where she just sits outside for four days and starves until they let her in and obviously while she's there she has to protect her identity as female so that she isn't removed from this monastery. This is set on the background of there is a context like a historical note at the beginning Shelley Parker Chan says that they took like a lot of liberties with the history the time that this is set is when the Mongol Empire were ruling over China they had conquered the Song Dynasty in the south so they had like the whole of China under their control but they were experiencing difficulty because of all of the issues they were having with drought and famine because it is said that if the ruler of the land is not a good ruler then the conditions of the land will be bad and there's also a a rebellion which I think is potentially left over from the destruction of the Song Dynasty that is springing up and causing conflict for the Mongol Empire and the monastery where our main character Chu is at have always taken a very like Switzerland kind of approach in this conflict. They've hosted the rebels, they've hosted the Mongol Empire and they have never chosen a side up until they are kind of forced to choose a side and that is where we get kind of like the setting shift of where I'm at now where we have gone into multi-perspective and the other perspective is a general for the empire that is a eunuch whose entire family or clan was killed by the empire aside from them. It's interesting so far. I feel like it's not at the moment as complex as I would like it to be. I'm not really feel like I'm listening to it and it's fine. It's okay. I'm having a decent time with it, but I'm not like invested or anything at this point, which is why I do want to switch over to reading it physically and see if that changes my opinion at all. Because right now I'm feeling very ambivalent towards this and it's actually one that I anticipated really enjoying. So my goal for now is to get to page 200 and I'll check in at some point and let you know whether the issue is the audiobook or whether the issue is that I'm just not that into this story. We had plans for us to move away when you were 25 Now we say goodbye for the last time I don't think I can move on These photos remind me of us When we so far away sat Disney And then night you kissed me So I did not end up reading quite as much as I anticipated yesterday afternoon so I never came back and gave you my verdict on whether it was better to read this physically or with the audio. I can confirm now that I am enjoying it a little bit more now that I've switched to the physical and I actually intended to kind of dip in and out of both because I've been making candles today. I thought that I would listen along to a couple of chapters of the audio. I, I can't I can't dip between them because of the pronunciation. Like I know that my pronunciation when I'm reading it with my eyes is off so like I can't match up the names in the audio book to the names with my eyes unless I read along at the same time so I'm just gonna stick with the physical one for this. I've read quite a bit now I'm on page 270 so I am anticipating finishing this tomorrow. I'm doing sprints I think tomorrow evening with my patrons so I think I should get quite a bit read then. Am I enjoying it though? Good question. I am. I'm especially liking the family drama, shall we say, that's going on in here and the kind of back and forth betrayals and backstabbing and the machinations of some of the characters in that regard. The main perspective of Zhu, because like I said, like we get to a certain point and it's split perspective. So we have Zhu and then we have like the Mongol side of this battle. The perspective of Zhu, I'm not enjoying quite as much as I am the other perspective. I feel like there is just a little bit more drama in that other side, whereas like the Zhu side of the story it is a little bit more political, which is fine. And I'm liking just not quite as much. But I think while I'm enjoying the plot in here, I feel like there's a distance between me and this book where I'm not like in it. Like I'm not rooting for the characters, which as you all know is super crucial for me when it comes to how much I'm enjoying a fantasy. So I feel like there are moments of like high emotion, high drama and things that are going on that I'm not quite feeling the full effect of as I would be if it was like a little bit more emotive within like the 
outright in itself. It's not especially cold or anything. It's just not super descriptive. And I feel like, I was gonna say that the characters themselves are quite emotionally detached, but that is only true of one of them, which is, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I should look it up. I think it's Uyong. You'd think that I would retain some of this because I listened to a bit of the audio, but I'm not, like I can't match this the names that I heard to the names that I was seeing. I could do with like listening to the audiobook while I read along a little bit so that I can get to grips with the pronunciation, which might be a good show. Oh Young. Oh Young. Okay, so Oh Young is, I would say, quite emotionally detached, like for reasons. Zhu, not necessarily. She is to a degree, but I think a lot of her character at this point is kind of rewinding some of that emotional detachment moving forward. And I think Zhu's perspective is about how to grasp her brother's fate while also holding on to herself a little bit amongst all of like this war that's going on between the rebels and the Mongol Empire. Yeah, I'm having a good time with it, but I'm not like super invested in the story. If I had to rate it right now, I would say it would sit at like a high three star. At the minute, I'm undecided whether I would continue on with the series. So we'll see how the last 100 and so pages play out before I can, before I give you those answers. morning guys i've just finished my morning workout i did 20 minutes of pilates and 30 minutes of yoga today i'm doing the new chelsea jackson set in terms of yoga because i think she's my favorite peloton yoga instructor i find something very very like calm about her and as i've only recently got back into yoga over the last month or so because since i hit 30 i need to stretch and like work on flexibility in a way that's like kind of come naturally to me in the past i've really enjoyed her but i'm just making my coffee and i'm gonna squeeze in a chapter it's like 8 45 i'm gonna squeeze in a chapter before nine um although at some point i will need to shower and get dressed but i mentioned to you guys in last week's vlog that i have started working out in the morning and the reason why i've started doing this because i'm generally like an evening workout person back when i used to go to the gym like many years ago because i've been working out at home for like two years now but when i used to go to the gym i went after work like i went at 7 p.m and i find that like because i don't eat a lot in the day i kind of eat small meals up until the evening where I have like one big meal. So like an hour or so after I've eaten is the time when I have the most energy and my workouts feel the best. So I've always been an evening workout person, but over the last like month or so, I've been feeling really like unmotivated, tired, sluggish, slumpy. And so I wanted to do some like physical activity in the morning to kind of encourage motivation and like bring energy into my body and like all of that kind of stuff. So I've started most mornings, I'd say, four times a week getting up half an hour early and the first thing i do is i get brie ready for a walk and we get out of the house we do a 25 minute walk i come home and i do 40 to 50 minutes of exercise and i feel amazing i have so much energy i'm bouncing around the kitchen making coffee and getting straight into my work day at 9 a.m and i'm more motivated and energized which is exactly what i wanted to be but I'm not reading anything. I, like I've discussed over the last couple of years or so, I've had like a big lifestyle change essentially. And I've discussed how since I fixed a lot of bad habits, I read best in the morning now. I'm a morning person, I never used to be. But my reading like is most productive. My brain is most awake in the morning. And the reason why that kind of shift started to happen is that I started to feel a lot of like tiredness and like with my hormones and bits like fatigue in the evening, like I felt that I was getting tired quite easily. So now I'm just used to reading in the morning. It's where I'm most awake, where I used to start reading at like 8 p.m. until like two in the morning when my sleeping pattern was all over the place. But now I read best in the morning. And if I'm working out in the morning, I don't have time to read in the morning. So I can either read or feel energized. Like those are my options. I can either work out in the morning and feel great, but read nothing. Or I can read in the morning and spend all day feeling sluggish and unmotivated. So all of this week, I have to work out in the morning because I have something going on every evening in the weekdays. So if I want to work out, it has to be the morning. 
since I've like recognized this pattern that like I read best in the morning and if I work out in the morning then I don't read very much in a day at all. It's kind of given me like an allowance in myself. I don't know how to describe it. Like it's allowed me to enjoy my evening workouts more because it's taken away the pressure to read because I know that trying to read at that time is pointless. So at the minute I'm like alternating between working out in the morning, working out in the evening, depending on what else I have going on in the day. But I think maybe going forward when I have the freedom, like the time in the evenings to work out, I think I'm gonna walk a brie in the morning and then read. So like I'm getting a bit of exercise and I'm still getting my reading in and then I'll do my workout in the evening guilt-free because I won't have that feeling of, oh my God, I should be reading because I know I can't read. Like I just don't do my best reading in the evening. I just wanted to give you an update on that. The morning exercise is working amazingly. It just has some like consequences and drawbacks that I didn't think about when I started it. In terms of reading, I worked out yesterday morning. So I didn't read very much yesterday and I have like 60, no 45, I think pages left of of she who became the sun. So my plan is to get that done as soon as possible today, but I do have a lot of things that I need to get done today. So we'll see how that goes. I also have a community meeting at seven, so I'm just generally not really gonna be able to read at all tonight. But my goal is to get through She Who Became the Sun, the last like 45 pages. Um Oh my god, you scared the shit out of me. And then bring you my thoughts so we can move on to another book for this vlog. Good afternoon. I did manage to squeeze in the last 40 pages of She Who Began the Sun by Shelley Parker Chan, which makes our first book for this video complete. And as I predicted a little bit earlier on, I did give this a high three star. I did enjoy it. There's lots of elements of this that I really really liked, especially the fact that we have such morally grey main characters. And the reason why this is just a three for me, why I enjoyed it but I didn't like love it, is because I didn't feel like I was rooting for anybody in here. I didn't feel like I was truly invested in the stories or the characters and their motivations while still reveling in the drama, the betrayal and the chaos. But kind of like from afar, like I want to feel like I knee deep there in the conflict as everybody's stabbing each other in the back but I did really feel like I was watching this from afar and it's not even like the reason why I didn't connect to the characters and didn't root for the characters isn't even because they're morally grey and because they're constantly doing bad things because for me I personally love nothing more than a character that is morally complex and messy and complicated and where you can really like you're struggling to justify why you are rooting for them so much as they're literally doing terrible things and I love our main character of Zhu and that like she is so ruthless like she is gonna stop at nothing to achieve what she wants and I gotta respect it like I love that but it's just the distance to me the way I, I the entire time I was reading this I was aware that I was reading a book and I don't want that like I don't want to feel like I'm reading a book I want to feel absorbed in the story and while I was reading this like that barrier was never really crossed for me but I did really love the intricacies of this plot the backwards and the forwards between like characters loyalties and the plot twists as they took everything just like that one step too far and the repercussions of that and and also like the, I guess, the reactions of people around them to their actions. I also really like that we had this backdrop of historical China. I didn't love the magic in here because it isn't explained, like the focus of this is the military plot line. It is a military fantasy above all else. You are spending most of your time with like the strategy and the politics and the, the fighting of this, this battle between these two sides. But there is magic in here and it's such a small part of the plot that it isn't like fully fleshed out and developed with rules. The way that I like magic to be, it's more like a divine thing, like you have been blessed with this magic from heaven. And the way that it's described like through a lot of this, I was like, I don't even know if this is real or whether it's metaphor. Like I don't know whether people actually do have fire in their hands or whether this is like a symbolic way of describing it and just that little like intangible form of magic is not personally my preference. While I liked this I am disappointed because going into this I had the expectation 
expectation that I was going to love it. And I have made the decision begrudgingly that I'm not going to be continuing on with this series, which I'm also sad about. I don't mind not liking books and I don't mind saying I'm, I'm not continuing the series anymore anyway. Like it's something I used to have a real problem with. But now like I'm happy to call it quits and say like, I don't want to continue this series. But when I had expectations of loving the book and I only liked it, then I find it hard to let go. Cause like I had the expectation that after finishing this book, I was going to order the Illuminate edition of book two and that's not happening now. And it feels like a, cause I really like get stuck in routines and like if I make a decision, I follow it through. So coming to terms with that is like disappointing. I do really like it. I feel like I understand why a lot of people really like this book and I did like it, just not to the degree that I expected, sadly. I would potentially consider reading more from Shelley Parker Chan in the future. It's just whether the writing ever crosses that barrier for me of being immersive enough that like I'm so invested in this character in these stories because it was so close to me. All I had to do was cross that that barrier where like I felt like I was emotionally invested in this story and it would have been like at least a four because it was almost there to start off with. But our next book has to meet a lot of criteria. I have to say I realised that the mixed tapeathon starts tomorrow and I'm also, I didn't realise this at the time that I planned it, but my 24 hour readathon with my patrons for this month, it's just the top two tiers, so the card in a circle. That is also starting tomorrow and that also has a prompt. Obviously we have a prompt, we have criteria to fulfil for this video. So the next book that I pick up, because I am going to be getting a head start, I do have to read my section of the heroes for today, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be starting my next book tonight or whether it is going to be tomorrow, but if I do start it tonight, I am technically getting a head start on the mixed tapeathon. But for this vlog, we have to read books that were published in 2021 that I got from subscription box companies in 2021. For mixed tapeathon, I have to read a book that's either set in the woods or has tree creepy trees on the cover or features a journey of any kind. And for my Patreon readathon, I have to read a purple book. And you know what? I don't know how these managed to come together. Actually, no, I do. It's because subscription boxes love purple. So I actually had quite a few purple books to choose from. But the one that I'm going for, I'm going to go for a sequel, which is not a book that I got in a regular monthly subscription box in 2021, but it is one that I ordered from Fairy Lou that was published in 2021, which is Kingdom of the Cursed by Kerry Maniscalco. I have been putting this off for so long. I read the first book the year it was released, so 2020. And wow, I've just realized how long ago that was. So I'm definitely going to be looking up a recap of King of the Wicked before I get into this one. I have heard, because I thought everybody still really enjoyed this series, I have since heard that the plot goes downhill in the second book, but I know that the spice level also goes up because book one is YA and book two is new adult. I love the art on the inside. Oh, I forgot how beautiful this book is. She's a stunner, guys. She is a stunner. So I'm actually just thinking about it. Like, what if the plot does go downhill and I don't end up liking this one? Because I remember it took me a while to get into book one. It took 40% and I was like, this just feels like super basic generic YA. Like it's not doing anything exciting. And then it just crossed a barrier and I got really into it. But this one is a fantasy romance following a girl. It's set in Sicily and it's following a girl whose twin sister is violently murdered. And the main character, so they come from a family of witches, but they're like good witches I guess and the main character ends up dabbling in black magic to try and find out what happened to her sister and accidentally summons a prince of hell, Prince Wrath. Now I don't want to spoil this but if you guys have read Kingdom of the Wicked you will know that there is a journey at the end of that book and the word travelled is in the synopsis. I'm not gonna tell you where she traveled to because I feel like that's a spoiler, but there was definitely a travel element that happened at the very end of Kingdom of the Wicked, which sets us up for Kingdom of the Cursed. I am actually excited to get into this one just for a little bit of a change of pace because I have actually just been reading two military fantasy side by side. And it's a lot, there's a lot of parallels in between like character archetypes and like themes recurring through those two books, which I did find interesting to think about. So from what I remember, the reading experience of this, like the writing style is pretty easy and hopefully after I've read oh oh okay it had a section that said sometime before which I thought was going to be a recap of Kingdom of the Wicked but I actually don't think it is I'm actually really excited to read a sequel if I'm being honest because I feel like it's been a while but um actually no I've just read I'm reading a sequel right now and I read one last week so I'm just making stuff up at this point. Regardless, Kingdom of the Cursed is my next book. I have 12 hours of sprints coming across Thursday and Friday. So my aim, cautiously, is to finish it um, on Friday, but we'll see how that plays out. Now we say goodbye for the last time. I'll be
Good morning. I've actually got quite a bit done today and I'm actually pretty proud of myself considering it's only like 11.45 and I'm ready to set up for the second sprint session in my Patreon at 24 hour refund which starts in 15 minutes. So I have made a little bit of a dent in this. I'm 100 pages in and this reads pretty quickly which is good and I'm also really enjoying it. I didn't even look up a recap of book one and considering it's been three years since I read Kingdom of the Wicked I'm not struggling with this at all but I do feel like there is a tone shift very dramatically between books one and two because when I read book one I enjoyed it I gave it four stars but for the first 40% it felt like kind of pretty bland generic YA wasn't loving the main character wasn't getting on with the plot just wasn't vibing with it at all so it had like a very solid like YA fantasy feel to it and from the very first page of this now I went into this knowing that this was new adult whereas the first book had been young adult but I thought that that would be like the reason why it had been labeled as new adult was just because the like I've got hair in my eye or mascara or something and I'm just really just not having a good time with it. So I thought that the reason why this one had been labeled as new adult was because it was going to be pretty much the same writing, the same story, but with like more explicit sexual content. From the very first page of this book, like it feels very different tonally. Like this feels like a Kindle Unlimited fantasy romance. And I don't mean that in any negative way like it's not like the writing's worse or anything it just feels like i'm reading a completely different book that being said i am enjoying it i was talking about this book with my patrons again last night because as i mentioned like I, I'd heard from them that the plot flops a little bit in this one. So far I'm not really getting that but I am only 100 pages in like there's not been too much in terms of any plot progression at this point but I am a sucker for wrath so if there's just a ton more romance in this I'm kind of down although like I said that isn't really what I expected from this. I did expect it to be the same kind of story just where it was smutty to be a lot more explicit than you would find in YA but it seems like just generally this is going to be a lot more smutty which is interesting it makes me wonder what Carrie Maniscalco's intentions were when this book was published like did she make book one more YA to get it published because she'd previously published a YA series and then when Kingdom of the Wicked was a huge success like fill this one full of smut but surely she'd already finished writing the majority of this by the time Kingdom of the Wicked was published because of how publishing schedules work or was it like a response to the trend in fantasy romance with 2020 being kind of like the start of the rise of fantasy romance as a genre where now it's being picked up left right and center by all of the publishers. Did she take advantage of that trend when she was writing book two? But once again, this book published in 2021, you would assume would have been majorly written by the time that trend started to rise because it only started picking up I would say. It started in 2020, it started to gain a little traction in 2021 and then 22 and 23 is like where that's really like peaked or maybe not peaked but we are on a rapid ascent up there. I'm interested in what Kerry Maniscalco's vision was for this series when she started and what was it that made the shift like was it always intended to be this smutty but she needed her foot in the door or was it a response to readers or a response to current trends. I don't think I'm going to end up finishing this today but I am planning on getting at least like another 200 pages into it which I feel should be pretty doable. I'm just excited to chill out and read all day. I can't lie. I feel like every minute of every day throughout the end of this week is accounted for and I just want some like a solid amount of time to just kind of even though I'm still doing sprints even though I'm here because I'm doing a readathon just to you know like relax and read. I am actually really excited because I if I get an item in a subscription box that relates to a book that's on my TBR I always want to save it for when I'm actually reading that book and when I say item it's mainly candles but I have I remembered last night that I do actually have a Kingdom of the Wicked candle this one is called Sea and Vine it's by the Midnight Flame Company and it was in one of the Abraxas boxes that I got was it last year or the year before um, but the scent is Sweet Vanilla Cannoli because Sea and Vine is the name of Amelia's family's restaurant in Kingdom of the Wicked and I'm so excited that I can now burn this like as I'm reading the book but at the same time this is one of my favorite scented candles that I've had from subscription boxes so I always want to save it but honestly I need to stop hoarding stuff and just burn it but you don't get candles in subscription boxes like you used to because obviously like with the amount of subscription boxes that companies are making now these are a handmade item like I don't think I could make <laughs> the amount of candles that would be required for like one monthly subscription box so I feel like they're more rare which makes them more precious. Good morning. 
it is 6.30 a.m. and I am up at the crack of dawn because I am going to Newcastle today for booktube meets, which is really exciting. But I'm gonna take like half an hour to calibrate before I get ready to leave because while I have been getting up really early, or for me, really early, for quite a while now, six o'clock is something else. I made it to She's Newcastle. Like as a frame. Oh, as I should. As yeah. I should. <laughs> there we go, that's better. That's, that's, the, that's the crop we all want. So comfortable. No one seems to hold me like you do. You're so wonderful. A star could never shine as bright as you. So I started watching YouTube in April 2017. And by why I started a channel because I, I kind of had a bookstagram, I don't know when the bookstagram was a thing, and I was like trying to do Instagram. Um, and then I stumbled upon YouTube and like I had a background in performing arts, like I'd done public speaking and stuff before, so I was like, well, this like feel is the bookish platform that I could be good at. And I saw that as the company, and I was like, oh, that's so much fun. And they stuck it for itself. I did. <laughs> I made my own version of it. I mean, when I started it, it was because. La La started the trend, and then Cody did the Wheel of TBR, and I was like, this is really cool. Um, and I'm like a massive fan of Monopoly, I've got so many Monopoly sets, like all of the different like, types. And I was like, if I'm going to combine any game with reading, then I feel like Monopoly is a good one to go with. I didn't expect it to become such a thing. Like, I turned my notifications off like shortly after launching Book Monopoly, and I had not turned them My phone is dead silent. If you ring me, I'm not getting it until I look at my phone. Um, so like, no, I did not expect it to take off like it did. I didn't expect to have like a readathon now uh, where everyone can play. So there's lots of video ideas I, I feel like I've done like that that have become a little bit of a staple. But what I really didn't expect was the um, Beatles was self destruct in 12 months, which was like, literally, I had a video, like, because I post on Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday every week, and I was like, I don't know what I'm posting this week. And I was like, oh, what if I did this and just called it this? And, and now it's a thing, and I find that's all I find the weirdest, I feel. Um, but, so fun. Yeah, because like, I literally just like, have no idea what I'm going to post. Like, oh, I'll just make this up. Somebody commented on one of my videos that I've just DNF you again, and I thought they meant that they'd stopped watching my video and then commented to tell me. <laughs> and then I looked at it and I was like, oh, no, it's, the, it's, just, it's just the book. You reminded me of that, too. You said, I don't like, like you. I've done, a, I've done a naughty. What are you doing, Gav? I'm buying more One Piece stuff. Why? Like, I have the money. Why? Because I love it. Okay. And I deserve yep. it. Is that valid, Leon? Leon <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> just, just storms off. Rude. This is Harry, by the way. Hi. Hi, Harry. Hi. We love Harry. We do love Harry. You should all buy that also. Oh yeah, you kept mentioning Very that was good. a good yeah, thing. I mean, yeah. Like that, I mentioned it twice, Gavin. You kept mentioning that. Yeah, you kept mentioning it. You kept getting it. on me too. Hello from my hibernation station. Once again, I love Sundays. And I actually, well, I was going to say I don't plan on getting changed out of my pyjamas today. I think I'm actually going to shower and then change into new pyjamas at some point. But yesterday was so good. Like that was my first in-person panel experience. And I had a really good time. I thought I'd be a little bit more nervous, but it was almost like, it was just like doing a live show really just in person instead of online and I'm really happy that I got to meet especially like one of my patrons Harry who is in the b-roll of this video who has been my patron since pretty much since I started patreon and like previous to that has ordered like a bunch of candles so like that was really cool and like meeting everyone else seeing like Hannah and Abby again meeting Olivia for the first time was great and I obviously had a great time with Leanne and Gavin as well I do have a little bit of a book haul I finally went to Waterstones and managed to get those books that I've been talking about for over a month since like at some point in October, I have needed these books. But you know what I'm like? These added up to 24 pounds and it's free shipping on Waterstones over 25. So I obviously was not going to just get them, but I couldn't think of like another book to add. Ironically, I've just realized because we went to Forbidden Planet, there's a new volume of Orange that has been released this year, which I didn't know that it was coming, but like seeing as it's here, I do want it. And I could have added that to my basket, but I also like, I never shop books in store because I have like everything I want is 
pre-ordered already or like if it's a sequel I just kind of like grab it as I need it. So I really like going in store and picking things up and I checked to see if these were in stock in Newcastle and they were so I finally have them and I'm really glad because one of them is The Exiled Queen by Cinder Williams Chimer which is the second book in the Seven Realms series. This is one that I read I think in the second week of the Spookopathon. I read book one in this series. It's a YA fantasy, high fantasy multi perspective that I was worried I wouldn't like anymore because it's YA and I'm for the most part grown out of YA but I actually really really enjoyed it so I really want to continue on with the series. This one is it's chunky and book one was chunky but they read pretty quick and this one is like 580 pages. I do actually want to get to this before the end of the year. I think my plan for December is going to be to get through all of my required reads that keep kind of not piling up because I am clearing through them but I'm never clearing the stack completely. I want to clear the stack completely in December so I start 2024 with a fresh slate and also focus on sequels so hopefully I'll get to continue and speaking of both TBR and sequels this book is heavy and it is the sixth Wheel of Time book which is Lord of Chaos. As you all know I am a co-host for Wheel of Time along this one is the book for um, technically October and November but the live show will be in December so I will be reading it in December. I think we're aiming for the 10th for the live show so I actually might start it soon because I'm listening to the audio as well so if I I just use this as my audiobook, especially now that I finished like the Cody Rigsby's book. Um, I finished listening to that the other day. I now have space for an audio, so I might just start listening to this at times when I would normally listen to an audiobook to get a little bit of a head start because it's it's a big one. It's one of the biggest in the series. It's 993 pages without the glossary. So seven pages off a thousand. And if the live show is potentially gonna be on the 10th of December, I don't wanna have to read 99 pages a day of this in December to get through it. I want my December to be a little bit more chill than that. So that one I may start very, very soon, but it is like, this is densely packed with very thin pages. So she is a heavy one. I have the catch up book club live show for the heroes at 8 p.m tonight that is the only thing i kind of have on so i think i'm going to play Baldur's gate for a couple of hours because i haven't had a chance to play at all this week i think the last time we played was maybe monday i'm gonna read for a couple of hours make dinner and then have a shower and change into new pajamas <laughs> before the catch up book club live show even the dark they still see light even the birds still sing at night every word just comes out right good afternoon i am about a third of the way through labeling the candles from friday's restock so i'm gonna put some youtube on in a minute and make my way through the rest of that if i've done a third i think i've got about 100 candles left to go yeah because i've I've done 40 so I've got exactly 100 left to go but I did want to let you know that this morning I finished Kingdom of the Cursed by Kerry Maniscalco and I enjoyed this one. I don't know whether it's actually because I left such a long break between books one and two that when I went into this one having been warned a little bit by my patrons as well that like the plot isn't as prominent necessarily as it is in book one. I enjoyed this and I am a sucker for wrath as I said that very much helps. This is a Court of Mist and Fury 2.0 as well. Like, like this is Wrath is Resand 2.0 and does that contribute to why I like him and why I like this book? I'm naive, I'm <laughs> sure that it does. I did give this one like a very low four star. I was, when I was reading it, I, I was pretty confident it was gonna be like 3.5 slash four. It did just come in at a four, which I feel is a pretty accurate rating for it. I enjoyed it. I liked the romantic elements in here because as I said, it's like a Resand 2.0 kind of situation. The plot in here, I, I do still think Think it has one but I think that it developed quite slowly because a lot of this book is establishing Amelia in the area that she travels to like right at the end of book one and all of that environment and like world building as well as building the relationship between Amelia and Wrath. There is very much like her driving force for doing anything or like the things that she does within these portions is still the driving force that she had in book one is she wants to find out what happened to her sister and as that plot develops like she's still following that path but I would say that not necessarily all of the steps that she was taking to follow that path necessarily made the most sense like obviously as we're going through this plot she is also exploring this area and it feels like the reason why she had to do these things for the plot was actually so that we as a reader could learn more about the area but like I said it has been a while since I've read the first book as well so the while I 
very much retained all the information I needed to to go into this sequel, which is mad because it's been 30, 13 years, <laughs> three years. I was obviously hazy on the final points. And seeing that, this book did reference like magical things and battles that happened in book one that I have no recollection of at this point. And this didn't really have any moments of high action like book one did in that regard. So I do see why people would say that kind of like the plot goes out the window or there's a lot less plot or there's a lot less, or there's a lot more smart. I do definitely think that's valid and I, that's why I think it's actually a good thing that I left three years in between the two books and that I was warned by my patrons because it gave me like I guess lower expectations and also that distance gave me like a little bit of a hazy like the details are hazy which I think actually might have been a good thing before I went into this so I'm really excited to get to Kingdom of the Feared and if it's possible depending on what prompt comes out for next week because I know I can't read it for my final book of this vlog but whatever prompt comes out for the next vlog. I hope it's one that allows me to finish this series because y'all know. I say any excuse to finish a series, I do or sometimes have opportunities to finish series and I choose not to. For our final book of this vlog, I was looking for my second mixed tape -a book and my choice of prompts with either a book that features a creature and it can be any kind of creature or a book that has a house or a place that has a sinister atmosphere or like is almost a character within its own right. So I think that this book fits. This is one that I just found by chance upstairs when I was looking for 2021 releases or books that I received in 2021 subscription boxes. And we've gone for book of the month. So something that I also like about this video is that each book that we've read is from a different subscription. This one is from December 2021 and it is A History of Wild Places by Shea Earnshaw. I can't remember. I think that this might have been an add-on book for December, not one of the actual you know, like normal genre selections. And it is a mix of genres. I actually had to look it up because I wasn't sure what it would fit into because the synopsis very much sounds like a thriller but I for some reason was pretty sure that Book of the Month had it down as a fantasy pick and the actual synopsis sounds like it strays a little bit into horror so I looked on Goodreads and it's categorised as all three. So I guess we'll find out together what the vibe of this book is. But I'm familiar with Shea Renshaw because she is an author of YA fantasy. And I have read one YA fantasy of hers. It is called, it's something to do with winter. I haven't read the most popular one, which is, Oh my god, it says somewhere in here, I've seen it. The Wicked Deep. So I haven't read The Wicked Deep, which I think is her most popular book, but I have read Winterwood. And I really love the atmosphere of it. So this is, as far as I'm aware, her adult debut. And also I feel a very different vibe because of the thriller and horror elements being assumedly like really dominant in this. I'm excited to see if that atmosphere that she's really good at in YA fantasy carries over into adult thriller horror fantasy. So this one is about a guy who has a uncanny talent for finding missing people. So he has been hired to find a children's author and the author in question writes very like dark macabre children's books. This case leads him to the pastoral. It says this reclusive community was founded by like-minded people searching for a simpler way of life. But soon after Travis stumbled upon it, he disappears. So many years later, a lifelong member of this community stumbles across, is it Travis's name? Yeah, Travis his missing truck which I think prompts him to look a little bit further into this community that he's always been a part of. I am very excited for this. I wasn't really sure when I was looking for books what I was in the mood for and I think going into this knowing it's a blend of genres I like but not knowing which one's going to come through like the most dominant I'm really excited about. It reminds me of kind of a mix between the witch book that I didn't like. The Year of the Witching by Alexis Henderson and also Night Film by Marisha Pessel because Night Film by Marisha Pessel has that kind of like culty vibe but also like they go to a community or an area where like things are very strange. The Year of the Witching by Alexis Henderson because that has a very like strict religious cult kind of vibe. So I am hoping to get some of this read this afternoon. When I finish labeling my candles, I'm gonna move on to vlog editing, which I actually have some admin to do in the middle, but after that, like for the rest of the afternoon, I'm planning to edit my vlog, oops, and also uh, read as much as possible because for some reason today, I do not wish to be perceived and I just wanna curl up in a ball under a pile of blankets and speak to nobody. With you, I feel so lucky I met you and I still can't believe that I get to see those sacks from mountains tonight. I swear you must have felt from the sky. I feel 
Lucky I met you. It's not magical. The way I feel when you walk with the wind. It's not optional. I have an envelope here, which I believe is from Solaris. They sent me an email. I'm always surprised at how fast arcs get to me, but they sent me an email at the end of last week about an upcoming release in like sometime in the first few months of next year and it sounded intriguing oh it is so this one is red sight wait i feel like i recognize this based on the arc but i didn't recognize it based on the like full cover illustration that was on the press release which i think is really pretty which was part of the reason why i accepted this but this one the person who reached out to me said that it was like gideon the ninth meets june and i've just recently read and loved gideon so i was like absolutely the back of the proof says heresy is power chaos is divine and i recently like the last arc that i received from solaris was the pomegranate gate which i you guys know i absolutely loved give it four stars would recommend if you are a fan of city of brass or the winter tonight trilogy so when they reached out with this one that sounded like something i was interested in i was like you know what let's go the synopsis says corona has simple priorities stay on the navitas stay out of trouble and stay alive she may be a red seer a blind priestess with the power to manipulate space time but she is the weakest in her order useless and outcast or so she has been raised to believe as she takes her place as a navigator on an imperium ship corona's full destiny is revealed to her blood brimming with magic she is meant to become a weapon of the imperium and pawn for the order that raised her but when the ship is attacked by the notorious pirate Asta Haran Corinna's world is ripped apart. Asta has a vendetta against the Imperium and an all-consuming dark power that drives her to destroy everything in her path. She understands the world in a way Corinna has never imagined and Corinna is drawn to her against her better judgment. With the Imperium and the justice-seeking warrior Sahar hot on her heels, Corinna must choose her side, seize her power and fulfill her destiny or risk imperiling the future of the galaxy and destroying the fabric of face time of space time not face time well itself sounds interesting you guys know i love me a sci-fi i don't read nearly enough sci-fi considering how highly i rate sci-fi when i do read it it's also reminded me a little bit of red sister in the description with like the priestesses being raised amongst orders for like maybe particular reasons and the gideon the ninth influence in here is like obvious as well i'm not worried necessarily but the synopsis leads me to believe it might be a little bit faster paced than i typically like but the release date on this one is the 29th of february for the uk the 27th for the us so i think i'm probably going to try and squeeze this one into january if possible because i'm very very busy for the first three weeks of february so i would be very surprised if i managed to read anything i am going to thailand it's the thailand trip then so technically i have 12 hour flights to and from thailand where i will get some reading done but for the, that's it that's my only, I think, solid reading time for the first three weeks in February. But thank you very much to Solaris for sending this one my way. I'm after, like I said, how much I love the pomegranate gate. I'm definitely interested in giving this one a try pretty soon. Melt them down and let that go. This is your time. City just pulls me right to you. To you. I am already almost halfway through this book. I'm 168 pages into it and I am still confused about what genre this is. So the first 40 pages of this book is the guy Travis Wren looking for the missing children's author Maggie St. James and it starts kind of he's approaching this place called Pastora. We have fantastical elements in here straight from the jump because the reason why Travis Ryan is so good at finding missing people is because when he holds things that belong to somebody else he sees like shadows of them. He can like retrace their last steps or see like flashes of their life. So he has this item that's been given to him by Maggie's family which is leading him to this like remote location and we start as he's like following Maggie's last steps, like her last steps before she got to this community called Pastoral. His perspective abruptly ends with him kind of reaching the community and we then skip a undisclosed amount of years and we switch the perspective or the perspectives of Theo, 
Kala and B. They all live in a farmhouse together. Theo and Kala are married and B is Kala's sister. B lost her eyesight when she was 19 but her and Kala have always lived in this town and they have very different opinions. Up until B lost her eyesight she very much wanted to leave the town. She had dreams of like exploring the outside world and Kala is very much like rooted in this community. I say town it's it is like a it's a commune and Kala very much like believes in this ethos wants to stay and Theo is at a place in his life where he is just questioning everything that he believes about this community that they live in. So the Conf no what intriguing interesting confusing thing about this is that the reason why nobody leaves this community is because there is something that surrounds it called the rot the origins of this community is that it was founded in 1902 by i think they said was it german immigrants or like people german people who had come to america and were like trying to establish their own community so they built a few houses in this area and then they all just like abandoned it up until the 70s where this group of like hippies moved in and started their own commune now there is a sickness that is outside of this community that they call the rot and because of this they will not leave the boundaries and they are terrified of letting anybody out or in it is forbidden to leave the boundaries of this community otherwise you will have to go through something called the ritual to prove that you don't have the rot and the confusing thing about it is that everything in my gut is telling me that this is not real like this illness doesn't exist it's like a tool used to control these people but <laughs> they have evidence of it like they remember people dying of it they were even scared of the rain in case the rain carries it in and they have memories of people being out in the rain and like starting like their body starts to turn black and they they die the trees split open and like sap comes out of them and this is a sign of the disease like the disease lives in the trees and this is something that they're talking about like as it's happening another one of the fantastic elements is that B has really does she have really good hearing or is it just really good senses in general she can hear people coming from miles away she can hear people's heartbeats she can tell whether it's people have like and something wrong with their heart based on their heartbeat and she can hear the trees cracking but I just don't know if any of this is real there's something in here that is making people forget things that I am sure of and I'm wondering if that same thing whatever it might be is what's causing them to believe that there's potentially a sickness that maybe there isn't but that doesn't explain why the trees are splitting open so I'm confused I don't even know if I'm having a good time reading this book or whether I'm just reading because I want to know if any of it's real which is valid in its own right. I do feel like the perspectives of the characters isn't the most compelling thing. We do have a little bit of community drama in here like B has a relationship with the leader of the community, a sexual relationship and Kala and Theo's marriage is being tested because she is terrified of this illness and really just like wants to stay in the community and Theo is having thoughts about like what is potentially out there and like pushing the boundaries of the town and realizing that he's not sick. The only other explanation I could have for this sickness is unless it's fantastical of course which is an option but if not I like maybe some kind of radiation but if it was radiation there would be I imagine a lot of the population it's a small population would be dying of things like cancer and there'd be like anomalies within the wildlife and things so I don't know if radiation is a thing I kind of don't want it to be fantastical I want it to continue to seem like really eerie and confusing and then have like quite a mundane explanation that would be my ideal resolution I guess for this or like what I typically like in books of this kind but um yeah I'm definitely hooked enough to figure out the mystery of what's going on because the characters seem so confused like they're seeing things and confronting things that is challenging their beliefs about what they know and what they remember especially clues regarding these two people that have we know been to at least the doorstep of this community in the last 10 years Travis and Maggie I don't know what they're going to uncover like I have no idea at this point but I'm intrigued to find out so wish me luck because I do plan on finishing this today. I plan to edit this entire vlog and also to finish this book so all before 4pm as well because I have mixed tape sprints with I nearly said Brie <laughs> and then Beth and Leanne so I'm gonna kind of like wrap everything up at four so I have time to like an hour or so to eat 
and get myself together before I have to be back for sprints. So hopefully, yeah, we'll be finished before then, but I am so intrigued. So by some miracle, I did actually manage to practice what I preached today and I finished A History of Wild Places by Shea Earnshaw. I've read 230 pages of this today, so I am pretty impressed. What was not too impressive though, was this book necessarily. It did come in at a low three star and I don't know how I feel about that. I feel enjoyment wise, this is probably a two, but it did keep me intrigued. Like I told you guys earlier, I was reading for this mystery. Like I wanted to know what was going on and I could not figure it out. I did have some ideas at some point of things that could potentially happen, but I couldn't figure out how they were happening. And when it all came together, I was, I, I wasn't disappointed because the fact of the matter is, is that the mystery did keep me hooked. It kept me reading through the entirety of this book because I wanted to know what happened. I just feel like the, the rest of the story, I guess, wasn't as dynamic as I wanted it to be so while the mystery and the intrigue really did pull me all the way through this book that was the only thing that I really liked about this. The atmosphere was decent. Shea Earnshaw's writing is always atmospheric. I do feel like it has created a lot more atmosphere, more tension in her YA fantasy than it did in this, which at this point I would probably call this a thriller. There are fantastical elements, but I would definitely not call it a fantasy at all. And some of the elements of the atmosphere, some of the, I guess, mystery and sense of foreboding you get throughout this does lean a little bit horror. So I would say all of those descriptions, all of those genres are relevant and present in this story at some point, but I guess if I had to call it something, in, which I do for my spreadsheet. I would call it a thriller. I didn't love the characters. I feel like part of it does lean into this community though because it's a slow life that they live. Like they have specifically created this community for it to be away from the modern world, away from the rest of the world. They're self-sufficient. They have no contact with the outside world at all. And because of this, while they do definitely have things to do all day, like they have a life, the mystery and the plot of this kind of takes over their life. So I very much feel like this is a plot driven story. I just don't feel like there was any kind of sparkle in the characters that me really made them come alive from the page and you do find this with thrillers. Thrillers do tend to be a little bit more plot driven just essentially with the characters being just vehicles through which the story is told. But yeah this one it's hard to describe why I didn't like it because the mystery like I said the intrigue was there. The execution wasn't bad and it did keep me guessing all the way to the end so like it wasn't predictable. I just don't feel like I really liked it. I really like the cover of this though. So that was my second mixtape book done and the final book for this vlog. I will probably be unhauling this one. I think also probably going to be unhauling She Who Became the Sun. Eventually, not yet, they will go to the unhaul pile that I have only just emptied to be included in a full unhaul at a later date. But this does bring us to the end of this vlog. So for this one, we've read the books of 2021. I have so far only had through all of the subscription books, books that I've read for this challenge. I've only rated one above a three star and that was a sequel to a book that I'd already given four stars to. It was Kingdom of the Cursed. So this challenge isn't going super well so far. I have been thinking though, with the way that the Goldsboro vlogs always pan out for me, with the way that I always tend to like the ones that I don't expect to, and then the ones that I think I maybe won't like are the ones that I end up enjoying more. Because I am actually picking the books that I'm reading, I don't know whether like I just don't know what I like and I'm just picking the wrong things. I also think when I'm picking a book I am going in with a level of expectation that I'm going to enjoy it or potentially not enjoy it if it's something I'm thinking about unhauling. Whereas when it's a book that I don't think that I'm going to like or I just have it around to give it a try, I'm not expecting anything from it. I'm going in with no expectations which gives it more potential I guess to impress me. That's just a thought that I have been having recently. It might be interesting after I've finished the full month of this challenge to kind of see if there's any patterns in ratings and subscription boxes. Although I feel like that that's far too many statistics than I can currently wrap my head around. But that does conclude our second vlog for November. There is going to be at least one more. Depending on how the next one goes and how long it takes, I will potentially think about squeezing in a fourth that runs into December. But we will definitely have a third subscription box vlog coming to you, hopefully very, very soon. So once again, a big thank you to Wild for sponsoring this video. Please do remember if you would like to take advantage of Wild's biggest ever discount, if you 
you would like 30% off all wild products and you can head to the link in my description box or scan the QR code and use the code books30 at checkout to get 30% off all wild products. But aside from that guys I do hope you have enjoyed this video if you've made it this far. If you have please don't forget to like if you liked it and subscribe if you wanna and I'll see you guys next week. Bye! Oh you bite your friend like chocolate You say you will go where nobody knows With guns hidden under our petticoats We're never gonna quit it, no, we're never gonna quit it, no